Welcome to the Westminster Shorter Catechism. My name is Monty Collier. I am the teaching elder at Geneva Dutch Calvinist Church, Kingsport, Tennessee. In this lecture on the Shorter Catechism, we will examine the Bible to determine how many persons are in the Godhead. Let's get started. Question 6. How many persons are there in the Godhead? Answer. There are three persons in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one God, the same in substance, equal in power and glory. We have already demonstrated that the Bible teaches that there is but one God. Now we will demonstrate that there are three distinct persons in the Godhead. It will also be shown that the three persons of the Godhead are the same in substance and equal in power and glory. That the Bible teaches a plurality of persons in the Godhead is evident from the very first book of the Bible. In Genesis we read, And God said, Let us make man in our image. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Genesis chapter 1 verses 26 through 27. Did you notice in the verses the deliberate use of both the singular noun God, the plural pronoun us, the plural pronoun our, then back to the singular noun God, and singular pronouns? This is the first assertion Scripture makes of a plurality of persons within the Godhead. The Belgic Confession of Faith comments on this passage saying, Let us make man in our image. It appears that there are more persons than one in the Godhead. And when he saith God created, he signifies the unity. It is true he doth not say how many persons there are, but that which appears to us somewhat obscure in the Old Testament is very plain in the New. The Belgic Confession of Faith goes on to demonstrate the three persons of the Godhead in the New Testament. For when our Lord was baptized in Jordan, the voice of the Father was heard saying, This is my beloved Son. The Son was seen in the water, and the Holy Ghost appeared in the shape of a dove. Matthew chapter 3 verses 16 through 17, Mark chapter 1 verses 9 through 11, and Luke chapter 3 verses 21 through 22. This form is also instituted by Christ in the baptism of all believers. Baptize all nations in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. In the Gospel of Luke, the angel Gabriel thus addressed Mary, the mother of our Lord, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Luke chapter 1 verse 35 Likewise, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 14 And there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. In all these places we are fully taught that there are three persons in one only divine essence. The Belgic Confession of Faith, Article 9. The historical objections to these three persons of the Godhead typically come when someone or some group denies the divinity of the Son the Holy Ghost, or even both. That the Father is God is almost always taken for granted by those who object to the Trinity. However, objections to the Trinity are extremely serious, for not only is the doctrine a fundamental truth in theology proper, but each person of the Trinity, according to Scripture, has a major part to play in our salvation. It is God the Father who elects us unto salvation. It is God the Son who lives and dies for our justification. And it is God the Holy Ghost who applies the work of redemption to us. 
Understanding each person of the Godhead and their role in our salvation is a major part of understanding the sovereignty of God. Salvation is of the Lord alone. Psalm 3 verse 8 Those who deny the doctrine of the Trinity always develop a system of salvation based upon the sinner doing good works. In short, a denial of the doctrine of the Trinity necessarily leads to a denial of justification by faith alone. With the very gospel at stake, let's look at some verses which demonstrate that the Son, who is Christ Jesus, is divine. In Titus chapter 2 verse 13 we read, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. This verse clearly identifies Jesus to be fully and perfectly God. Jesus Christ is here called the great God and our Savior. This is supported by the context which is discussing the Lord's second coming. God the Father and God the Holy Ghost do not appear to us at the second coming, but only God the Son. Christ himself also says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. He that hath seen me, hath seen the Father. John chapter 14, verses 6 through 9. Similar to this passage is the following. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. No man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. John chapter 1, verse 1, verse 14, and verse 18. That the Holy Spirit is God can be proved by a bit of deductive logic. This is why we should study logic. It comes in handy in the interpretation of Scripture. The Bible declares, But Peter said, Ananias, Why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost, and to keep back part of the price of the land? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Acts chapter 5 verses 3 through 4. First, let me point out that it is impossible to lie unto one who is not a person, that is, one who does not have a rational intellect and a will. This verse asserts, among other things, that the Holy Spirit is a person. Let's look at a syllogism demonstrating this argument. Any being that can be lied to is a person. The Holy Spirit is a being that can be lied to. Therefore, the Holy Spirit is a person. The other obvious assertion made in this chapter from Acts is that the Holy Spirit is God. The assertion is confirmed within the context of verse 9 where we read, how is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Acts chapter 5 verse 9 Always keeping in mind the greater context of the entire scripture which teaches God is a spirit. John chapter 4 verse 24 This has been a very brief introduction to the doctrine of the Trinity. I hope it encourages you to continue your studies into this doctrine and others. For further reading, I would recommend Gordon H. Clark's book titled, The Trinity.